Aldir, Anakin's classmate at the Jedi Academy, wants to be a Jedi more than anything. But he can't even lift a feather with the Force. He thinks he knows how he can learn faster. The Holocron. The Holocron is a cube that holds all the secrets of the ancient Jedi Masters. By borrowing it, along with Obi-Wan Kenobi's lightsaber, Aldir believes he will become a powerful Jedi Knight. Now Anakin, along with Tahiri, R2-D2, Tion, and the Jedi Master Ikrit, must race across the galaxy to find Aldir. If they don't, Aldir could be killed, and Kenobi's blade and the holocron will fall into the hands of a very evil man. Junior Novel Podcast. I'm Levi Paratic, and here with me live in the studio, my co-host, Tim May. Hello, everybody. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And and we also, uh, it, to wrap up our, our week of Junior Jedi Nights, we're week? on the... Not week. Uh, well, I mean, there's six like, episodes. Uh, it's yeah, close yeah. to a week worth of episodes. Oh, if you listen to one a day. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. One, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Starting to make sense. Well, Mel, Mel Lyon is with us, of course. Yay. Oh, so this, I'm trying to figure out right now when the last time we recorded together was. Obviously, we would have done a couple last year had, you know, the world not ended. You're right. But I... It was definitely 2019. Yeah, and I think it was, there was an episode, I know we recorded an episode that summer, you came up to my place, mm-hmm. and I'm, uh, I will look through the archive here, give me one, okay. but yeah. you guys talk. Unless, unless someone erased it from the archive memory, <laughs> I hope that is <laughs> Well, Well, while Tim figures that out, this week we're of course uh, covering the final book, in the Junior Jedi Knight series, Kenobi's Blade, written by uh, Rebecca, and it's not Moesta. I've actually been re- uh, pronouncing it wrong the whole time, and I have it. Now I'm looking something up. <laughs> wow, because, so much. <laughs> so much. So no, much research and, and, and development and, 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 and non-preparation for this oh, episode. Oh, no, you're totally prepared H- hang for on. Our, hang our live on. studio <laughs> audience. <laughs> yay! Yay! <laughs> Oh, where is this information at? Oh, no. I think I know what it is. Uh, Mm. Yeah, I think it was all the way back, episode 14, The Deadly Hunter, because I'm thinking because I remember we took that picture of me choking you with the uh, oh. with the cord for the thing <laughs> mm-hmm. and the description of the episode says Tim holds Levi in <laughs> the grip of the whip <laughs> in a thrilling new episode of Battle on Library <laughs> Wow, the boys happen. discuss the de- Jude Watson's The Deadly Hunter and break down Tim's recent experience watching all six original Star Wars films in one day. <laughs> wow. wow. Old wow. times. That was uh, almost two years ago. Wow. That's so, crazy. Yeah, we, 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 uh, we, um, we uh, brought that joke back. Remember in that High Republic book, she had that whip lightsaber? We remember oh, yeah. the grip of the whip? I love, <laughs> that's my, my, that's probably, like, if we do a clip show, <laughs> that would definitely be in there. You should definitely do a clip show. Uh, yeah. Maybe I will. Oh, that would be fun. Ooh, I, I 
would the, be fun. I know the next, episode for that. Next time, in, <laughs> instead you, uh, instead of just canceling, you know, then you just throw together. Oh episode. yeah, like way more work. <laughs> go, go through all these episodes and find stuff. All right, I found my information. This is off of. Um, Rebecca's uh, website, her and Kevin's her word, her, fire. Her, her word, word fire. fire yeah. yeah, it's not Moesta, Moesta it's Mezta. Mezta, okay. Yeah, yeah the O is oh. silent. Um, All right, so. well, sorry to there Rebecca. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we you got just, it right by the end here. We'll so. put, you just we'll, go back and edit all of the Yeah, right? we'll yeah. actually, no, I know how we'll make up for it. We'll make up for it with our acknowledgments page. <laughs> so, oh, I, yeah, nice. Which I wanted to look to make sure, because this book also has the acknowledgment page, and I want to make sure it's the same the one. In, like, the last two uh, hang on. Actually, no, they are not the same one as before. Um... Yes, they are actually different. Uh, most of the same people are like still thanked, but it's written differently. Well, that's you know that that's reasonable. That's what you do. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> when you're writing a new book, you thank people, and you know you find different ways to thank them. Yep. So, all right. Anyway, so we're reading Kenobi's Blade, and we're also discussing the 1995 film The Blade. Which we are hot off. We oh, just finished yeah. this film. Yeah. The reason we're recording in person specifically today is that i had to come down and visit you guys so that we could watch the film in person because the only way to watch it is through a warner archive dvd Mm -hmm. (laughs) which i own and it is not available to rent anywhere i'm sure you could probably find it in you know more illicit locations Which but, you should, because this movie is definitely worth the watch and should be made available to the public. I agree. <laughs> I agree. It needs to be on Criterion. Criterion needs well, to be so, Well, in general, I think these this era of Hong Kong uh, cinema, the new wave from the 80s and 90s, a lot of that stuff is like the availability is all over the place. Mm-hmm. So I think it's because a lot of the stuff was originally licensed in the U.S. by like companies that no longer exist. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it, it's it's it, there's some complicated stuff. Yeah, because there's actually I noticed on the back of this box it says it's a Paragon film. Actually, 1995 Paragon films. Paragon doesn't exist anymore. So sure, but I mean, obviously Warner has the rights to it. I mean, but they should put it up on HBO Max or something. Mm-hmm. They, yeah. um, so I mean, HBO Max, like we said this last week, I just feel like they are dropping the ball as far as archive stuff goes. Uh, but we don't need to get into that. This movie, <laughs> no. The Blade, 1995, uh, it's uh, it's directed by Sui Hark, who's kind of a major figure of the Hong Kong New Wave. He was, uh, I mean, he started directing in the early 80s, but he was probably most well-known in the 80s for producing the John Woo movies, The Killer, Better Tomorrow. Uh, they had some sort of falling out. I don't know the details. Uh, Look it up, Wikipedia. I'm sure there are probably details, but um, regardless, they had some sort of falling out, and uh, Sui Hark wound up kind of continuing throughout the 90s to make really interesting movies while John Woo went off to Hollywood, and he made some interesting movies there, but, you know, obviously didn't Mm -hmm. get to retain the vice grip of control. So, (laughs) regardless, Sui Hark, most famous probably for the Once Upon a Time in China films, uh, I've seen the first of those, and it's a wonderful movie. Very different from this, a much more kind of traditional martial arts epic, mm-hmm. I would say. This movie is a little more... This movie's wild. It's wild and it very, is. and pretty brutal. Intri- um, well, speaking yeah. of brutality, this movie opens with a dog getting caught in, like, a bear trap. Yeah, so like, many bear traps. Which I think is actually a good, like, setup for this film, because everything... Like, you know right away what you're getting into, like, yeah. when you see that happen. Like, it is hard to watch. And you know what? So, you know, you, you're watching a movie, and so little do you see the use of bear trap. And then this movie is so, laden with so bear traps. Bear traps. <laughs> bear traps on bear traps, yes, yes. literally. Yeah, that literally happens at one point. A double bear trap. <laughs> <laughs> I would say there's a... Because, like, in terms of, like, bear trap violence in this movie, there are at least, like, what would you say, four or five times something or someone gets caught in a bear trap? Mm, I would say closer to, like, at least 10 times, <laughs> right? Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's... there's... Yeah, the dog and then the monk and then, yeah, that whole sequence. 
the lead. Yeah. yeah. The horse. Her. Right. Oh, right. Yeah. <clears throat> oh. So, the basic, I, this is basically a revenge movie. It's not super complicated, but there's our main character, uh, what's his name again? His name, hang Dao on. Dong, Dong, D- Ding, Ding On. on. Ding, Ding On. on. Yeah. Uh, who was played by Vincent Zhao, who uh, took over uh, Jet Li's role in the fifth, fourth and fifth Once Upon a Time in China movies, just if, you know. You recognize the name, maybe. <laughs> uh, but he uh, he's a blacksmith, orphan, doesn't know his parents, doesn't know his father. Um, he lives with this, I don't know, this kind of lord. A sword a maker. Boss. A boss. Yeah, a boss. A factory, yeah. Uh-huh. right? It's where, like a yeah, where like, all of his workers live in this kind of yeah. compound. And, and um, he has a daughter. Yes. And she has a thing for him, but she also has a thing for another guy who works there who's played by uh, Moses Chan, and his name was Tito in the movie. In the subtitles. In the subtitles was Tito. According to Wikipedia, his name is Ironhead. Uh, Hard. I like that. That that name's incredible. Yeah, but it's basically like, well, I wouldn't say it's a love triangle, because she's in love with them and, like, wants one of them, but, like... Neither of them are that interested in her. Yeah. Yeah. And she's not even really super sure, like, do I like one more than the other? Like, she really just wants them to fight over her. Yeah, like, that's the whole thing in the beginning. Very funny sequence. I... And, uh, basically, then these bandits show up. They're... Mm -hmm. They fuck shit up. And... One of them reveals to uh, Ding On that he knows who killed his father. Mm-hmm. Uh, who? What was that guy's name again? It was uh, uh, his father. Or no, the guy the... that he has. He's 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 has tattoos. Oh, no, the Falcon. The oh, Falcon. the Falcon. Yes, yeah. the Falcon. Yeah. He's known as the Falcon. He has tattoos all over his mm-hmm. body. Uh, so Ding On. Uh, also in this battle get like gets fucked up by all these bear traps. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And essentially his arm gets cut off. Mhm. And uh he there's a huge sequence cuz you know uh, you oh. can measure a great action movie by its set pieces and I feel like so much of action doesn't understand that anymore. No. But but he yeah, gets his he gets his arm caught in a double bear trap <laughs> and instead of like removing his arm from it he fights with it. Oh, and like, he also yeah. his backpack's on fire for half this fight. Yeah, right. most... The filming of that sequence had to be insane because it's like there's more than one take there and his backpack's on fire the entire time. Like, I mean, obviously, like, action filmmaking from this period of Hong Kong cinema is like, it's the greatest of all time, basically. These, <laughs> these, these, these guys were insane and they made, like, just crazy, like elaborate set pieces that I'm sure with no concern about, you know, <laughs> regulations or safety or anything. <laughs> yeah. But, but like, these things are wild. I mean, obviously you got, like, the extremes of, like, a stunt situation like mm-hmm. Jackie Chan movies or the, the gunplay of the, of the John Woo movies. But this is, like, what I find interesting, and I know you guys haven't seen Once Upon a Time in China, but the comparison is interesting because that movie is, like, almost, like, that came out a few years before this, and I feel like he was, like... Let's do like the like highest level possible of like a traditional wuxia epic, uh, and then this is like let's bring all that new wave mm. style, the the Hong mm-hmm. Kong new wave style, to that kind of movie. Uh, so it's interesting that he made both of them because like this one feels so much more of its moment, whereas that movie. It has, like, a kind of timeless quality, mm-hmm. which I like. But... Well, like, yeah, this you... movie's very stylized. Very stylized. Very which quick. Really the cool. speed of this movie is, like, yeah. something that blew me away. And just, like, not only are the fights choreographed, but the choreography of the camera oh, yeah. work, too. Yeah, it's which, really stunning. It's really stunning. Like, well, like, because, like, y- like, they will jump, like, the way, like, there will be a fight going on, and then, like, the camera will go to one side, and then it'll go back, and then there's first time i've ever seen a 
barrel roll, like a crocodile barrel roll. Like two people are fighting and they start rolling on the ground and the camera rolls with them. Like yeah. and like they must have just created like some sort of like wheel rig. I feel like to yeah. set the camera up. But, but even but then, it, it, and it's just like it's just that one shot. Yeah. Like they don't like do it again. It, but it almost <laughs> feels like there is like a guy holding the camera though because it's not like a smooth roll. Yeah. Like that's it true. is like this yeah. vicious like. Well, that's the thing about the, the holding. Like almost everything in this movie is done handheld mm-hmm. and not with steady cam or even seemingly dollies. Yeah. yeah. Like I, I like I feel like there's kind of a uh it, it's really exciting because they're doing moves that traditionally you only do with a, at least a dolly and probably a steady cam. Yeah. But like like yeah, certainly by the time this movie was made, but it's like it just gives it this like real like energy. Mm-hmm. Like I mean, obviously you have to have super skillful camera oh, yeah. guys, but it's just like well these guys, these camera guys had to be just doing as much choreography as like the sword play was going right. on because like it matches that energy so much because so much of the fight is just this frantic energy and the camera like elevates that yeah. too in its own frantic energy. I unfortunately I'm not seeing. Um, a credit here on the Wikipedia page for choreography. Oh, uh, what about um, IMDb? I'm sure there is one on IMDb, but regardless, then basically the guy is left without an arm. He goes off, is going to live just as a one-armed failure. Uh, that's how he describes himself. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and uh, then he's in the market one day. He goes off to another town. He's in the market one day and he sees... Uh, who he thinks is the Falcon, this guy that killed his father, because he has all these tattoos and he's talking. And this kind of reignites him, and he's thinking about it, and he's staying with this woman, uh, this beggar woman. What's her name again? I, I don't know that I they mention yeah, her name, because she doesn't even know her name. Yeah, that's like true, she doesn't. Moment. Yeah, and like she's credited here as Blackie. Um, <laughs> all right okay yeah by uh, played by uh chung b ka um so she's there and basically she, he's staying with her and then like a bunch uh, like this other group of bandits these these shitheads who this one guy like who smokes this super long opium <laughs> pipe yeah. is like like super smug with his opium and uh and he <laughs> Like, they, they, like, burn down her house and, like, fuck him up further. And they're like, stop, like, looking around at this shit. Like, you're you're a one-armed failure. You're a one-armed mm-hmm. failure. And so... Um, and then in the ashes of the house, Blackie finds a book that she can't read. And it's half a book. Like, literally, like, it's split down the middle. Yeah. And so it's all, it's all the pages, but only half, like, hot dog style we're yeah. talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's a kung fu book, is what the subtitles and, say. And by the way, he has his father's old sword, uh-huh. which was a hundred pound sword, and it got it got snapped in half. When he died. W- yeah, when the father died. When the father died. Uh, so he's got a 50 pound half sword. That's the only weapon he has. And so then he starts tying himself up to this rig with a rope and learning from the half, literally half the Kung Fu book, half, well, like, like half the page. Yeah. Like, well, he's like half a dude with half a book and half a sword. So like, good. Oh, and, and, like poetry. and so like, he's like, and he has to develop an entire new style <laughs> of sword fighting with this half sword and everything, and it's incredible. And then meanwhile, you have uh, the, the daughter of, of the Ling, Lord. I think yeah, is Ling her is her name. name. Yeah. And, yeah. And Tito. Yeah, Tito, also Ling. known as Ironhead. Ling is back there with Ironhead slash Tito, and uh, <laughs> he's, he's like a shithead, a bad guy. And, like, there's, like, basically the bandits have, like, brought this brothel to the town, mm-hmm. and, like, there's a prostitute played by Valerie Chow, who is, like, pretty well-known. She's in Chungking Express and uh, a couple other big Hong Kong movies. But, and, and so then uh, Ironhead is, like, clearly, like, I need to save this woman. She's, like, I don't give a shit. Yeah. And, uh, (laughs) and so (laughs) basically at this point, like, she forms a relationship with Lin, the daughter, and uh, they're they're uh, they, they talk about like you know 
what they what you know they can expect from men, what they want from men, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, this all eventually comes to a head where uh, uh, where Ding Ong. Ding uh, Ong and Blackie and are Blackie, yeah. are in they're in like the stable, which just so happens to be directly below a hotel room that Ling, the prostitute, and Ironhead are staying at. And then bandits come into the town. Yes. And yeah. then that's where it like they the, there's the, like the reunion and then like So um, he he um, like he doesn't want Lane to see him mm-hmm. like, you know, so he wraps himself with a mask, like some sort of like <laughs> Uh, like all around his face, all around his head, like he just looks crazy, honestly. <laughs> and like, and and he has this insane fight with the leader of the bandits. And the bandits, it's the it's the Opium Man, yeah. is the leader of that yeah. that bandit. And like that fight is crazy because he's like swinging the yeah, well, yeah he, blade. Has, he has the fifty pound blade on a chain at this point. Yeah, like, yeah, because moments moments before he's like in the stable with the pig, and the pig's chained up, and he's looking at the chain, and he's looking at his blade, and he's just like put these two yeah. things together and I'm even better wow. which like he he like he flies off the chain well and that's like what blows me away about the choreography of this too is because it's just like suddenly you have this like like flying object right. That's like that's like this kinetic motion going on that you're like you're filming this and like how do you even control that like yeah, it's insane I mean there's so much crazy stuff and like then at the end of that like Ding Ong is just like, I'm leaving. Peace. Like, like, and I, like he doesn't even acknowledge. Doesn't even. She knows it's him, but like he won't acknowledge that it's him. Mm-hmm. And then basically they all go back. Like, so the bandits have been expelled. The, the brothel seems to be gone. And by the way, the prostitute dies yeah. in this, which yeah. is like a very. That's a good scene with her and uh, Lane right, at right. the end. Uh, but then there's. But then basically the they go back to their regular like factory oh, compound yeah. thing and uh and Dinon's off somewhere and the place gets attacked it, uh the the falcon gets hired yeah to, to kill, kill the the uh Lane's father right and so he comes and like they start fucking shit up it well goes, well the, and then, like Ling's father has a uh, history with him because like because he was friends with he was friends with Ding Ong's father and was like he escaped the night that like Ding Ong's father was killed oh yeah now now this Which is we a, didn't really talk about yeah, that sequence, because there's an but... intense oh. flashback where, oh, yeah. right at the beginning yeah right. yeah yeah because like Ding Ong's the rest of Ding Ong's family was like killed by these marauders including the falcon i guess and then his father wanted revenge so in like this lone wolf and cub style there's this huge fight in the rain where he is fighting with a child on it's, his back it is yeah. unbelievable yeah. It, it, and it's like it's this like bright red pouring rain mm-hmm. like a truly like insane sequence mm-hmm. like i was like crazy slow motion just and Oh man, uh, I was I was so excited watching it. Um, then, so then the Falcon, who okay, first off, when he Ling tells Ding On about his father and how his father died, they said like it was this bandit. He was named the Falcon. He was the Unreal. He could fly. He was like he, <laughs> he could, could fly, fly, and he had tattoos. Those yeah. were the two things. Yeah. And everybody's like, "Can you really fly?" Like, and so. The Falcon shows up. He is about to kill Ding On's father when Ding On shows up for like the rescue. What? Why? Oh, you... you mean Ling's father? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He, Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. You're shaking. You said it. no. You said Ding On's father. And oh, Ling's died, father. Yeah. Okay. Ling's like, father. Okay. Jump to the present. Yes. I should say. No, so okay. there. Yeah. The Falcon shows up. He's about to king kill Ling's father. That's when Ding On shows up and like because like. The whole time he's fighting Ling's father, the Falcon's like, oh, you're too slow, you're too slow, you're too slow. Then he starts to fight Ding Ong, and Ding Ong's like, you're too slow. Oh. Like, yeah. So, yeah, and it, th- that's, that is one of the great fights I've ever seen in a movie. I agree. I have to say, that there is were, an insane th- fight. There yeah. were these continuous shots where, like, they would be fighting, and one of them would leave the frame... And then they'd re-enter the frame from a completely different side of the frame. There were, like, yeah, there were like shots where you would have 
this was, I guess, more in the sequence that was leading up to the final confrontation. But, like, there were shots where, like, there would be a guy uh, with a weapon. And, like, I, I actually can't even really describe it. It was, like, <laughs> yeah. it, like, it would, like, push in and then out, like, a, a, and then it would it would push in on somebody else. And it would pull out and the guy had, like, it, and it wasn't, like, this fake CG camera move shit that you see now that does this kind of thing. Like, it was crazy. It was, like, doing... T- crazy stuff with zooms and pullouts right. it is like just wild like the, the amount like it looks super chaotic but the amount of control necessary is insane <laughs> <laughs> like, I, 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 I agree so much yeah it's, it's... so yeah and then the movie i mean the movie ends with uh essentially uh ding ong and iron head uh, slash uh, Tito. Tito. <laughs> yeah, uh, they uh, they wind up uh, leaving, and Lynn stays at the compound by herself. And they visit every year or two, and then like we see her as an old woman smoking <laughs> opium, yeah, just yeah. chilling. <laughs> it is insane. Like it's so oh, good. It's so good. It's yeah. so good. It's very like Peter Pan ending. <laughs> yeah. It's and the final fight is like. It like it lives up because there's insane action leading up to this, but the final literally fight, all the way through, beginning yeah, to end, the action is crazy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, with the final fight, the tattooed falcon, he is like full of surprises because <laughs> uh, like he has two swords, then he reveals his swords have tiny blades in the yeah, base of right. them, and, and they're all... also on chains. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he has a chain too. So then we have like this <laughs> insane chain on chain sword fight, which is like this super close quarter sword fight you're like people are gonna get cut at any time that's a part two falcon he's like he's trying to talk some smack and then like he looks down at his chest and, and, and he realizes it's slashed and the blood just starts pouring out of it oh <laughs> right over the tattoos it's, right it's so good Which like well there's so much yeah. of that great stuff that delay like i mean that's a mm-hmm. very martial arts yeah. like movie trope but like i love like that like they slice and it's like it's quiet and then it's a delayed like you you see the effects, so it's like somebody starts bleeding, or like a bamboo stick actually yeah, falls. falls or whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah. good. And then no. and then Falcon in his he in total desperation reveals the final stage of his sword when it becomes not one but three blades. Oh yeah, like three blades, like out, <laughs> like out. It's so crazy. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean the final fight is incredible. Like and also the movie, like it's working on this very high like tone kind of mm-hmm. like like extremely melodramatic tone but like it becomes it is a very like emotionally effective yes movie and like uh i really like elaine is like a pretty cool character like yeah. like because she's like not like they don't like try to make like she she's like the daughter of this kind of like noble not noble but like this uh this businessman she's yeah. not like trained or involved but like the since the movie she narrates the movie so you get like in her head so she's not really involved in the action but it's like her perspective on all of it is like the the most important so it's like a really interesting mm-hmm. uh like way of using that kind of character mm-hmm. because you know a lot of th- these and like every character in the movie feels like very like fleshed out yes like without like giving even though obviously there's a flashback we described, but like it's not giving tons of backstory or like right. going crazy. Like it's just like every character feels like they they have so much. Like, they have a purpose. Personality yeah. that it's like you know them after like just a few lines of dialogue. Mm-hmm. Oh, and I really loved um, the use of color in this film, oh, especially like in the costuming because like the main characters, um, Ding Ong and Ling, they're like just like black and white, but mm-hmm. then it's like. Every or the Falcon is mm-hmm. like very colorful. Mm-hmm. It's like I don't really know what that means, but it's cool. There's it's some, very nineties. <laughs> there's, there's some great cutting too, where it's like you like you have two people facing off and you'll see like the one's reaction then it'll cut to the sky and there's yes. thunder yeah. then they'll cut to the other guy and there's like a flash of lightning and then boom a close up on his eyes then a close up on the other guy's yeah, eyes it's... another shot of the sky <laughs> like <laughs> it's just it is nonstop but it never feels like exhausting mm-hmm. like it's it's like it's just 
Um, you know, I'm not like an expert in Sui Hark or even Hong Kong movies. Like I'm, I, I watched them a lot, like as just a fan, as a like when I was a teenager. But like, I, I it's not like necessarily an area of expertise. But this guy, like, you know, I had seen Once Upon a Time in China, and I rewatched that somewhat recently. If you listen to the Tim Recommends episode earlier, <laughs> I, I talked about it a little. Um, but the, uh, <laughs> um, but I, I just. I think, uh, you know, and that movie is super well directed in a more, again, like I said, more traditional way. But this one, I was just like, this guy is like in complete command mm-hmm. of the art form in every way. Like, it's very impressive. And I've only, I think I've, I, he made a Jackie Chan movie called Twin Dragons that I've seen, I saw when I was a kid. But other than that, I don't think I've seen any of his other movies. He's still pretty active. I know he makes like the Detective D movies. I don't know how good those are, but uh, <laughs> but uh, like this guy like is just very impressive. I know he made the movie Woo Warriors in 1983, which I want to watch at some point, and that's a pretty influential movie. So I uh, this is getting me pumped to just like go deeper on this stuff. And it, and Warner I, has all these. All, has this deal with Golden Harvest, who is the studio that made this, and they have a lot of these available through Warner Archive. They need to make another deal and get this stuff on HBO Max because, like, I feel like this entire right. era of cinema, which was so important to people, like, I mean, I, to people my age and older, like, growing up, like, it, it showed you the possibilities of, of movies. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like it's, like, slipping away because they're, like, this stuff is just not widely or right, readily yeah. available so like i wish uh whoever the rights soldiers are on a lot of these studios stuff needs to like you know i mean obviously like things like the, the, like the major guys are, are still not that sui hark is a major guy but like a guy like Wong Kar Wai has get, got this big box set, even if the movies look like shit now, but we don't need to get into that. Uh, I mean, like, aesthetically, they look bad. The remasters look bad. I'm not saying the movies always looked great. I'm not, no shots at my guy. But, but, the, but, uh, but like, you know, he's getting his love. But, like, a lot of these action guys, and obviously it's not like the John Woo movies haven't been available, but, like, a lot of these guys from this era uh, just aren't, don't get the love from this used to be like i think the biggest foreign market of, for film in the u.s mm. in when i was growing up was was hong kong and uh it's weird to me that those the, i mean obviously obviously that's the industry changed when the handover happened which is only a couple years after this movie but like and so like new hong kong movies are obviously a very different thing but i just think this era the 80s and 90s hong kong cinema needs to live on with young movie people they need to see these movies because they're like they're crazy like and they're awesome and they're they will blow open the possibilities for you in your head of right. what this kind of movie can be I, so. yeah and, uh, especially because oh sorry no you go ahead mine's you. in the mind there there are a lot of new movies that i feel like are just like action 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 but suck so it's like, yeah, mm-hmm. let's, you know, well, I think, let's bring back some movies well, I think that action, can do it well. The Hong Kong guys, and, like, there are other great action filmmakers from the U.S., very famous people, James Cameron, Steven Spielberg, etc., that mm-hmm. know, know this, but an action sequence should operate the way that, like, a big, that any big yeah. set piece, any big set piece of, from any genre works in that you need to have emotional stakes mm-hmm. and, like, it should honestly tell its own little story. So you like you look at like the truck chase and Raiders is a good mm-hmm. like obvious example. But like that's that 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 has a beginning, middle, and end. It's important like in the story. It matters to like like without that the the climax doesn't occur. Uh, I don't buy into the whole indie is not important to the story. That's like a kind of a dumb fan theory thing. <laughs> Ew, I haven't heard that. I'm glad I yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, <laughs> like, it, it, whatever. Anyway, but but there's like other... Um, but, like, you know, I think the Hong Kong guys really treated them, and this goes back be, before the new wave to the Shaw Brothers movies and King Who and people like that, but you have... They treated them like musical sequences, so it, like it would in in, in old Hollywood. So it, I think there's just uh, 
there's just not this is just a true of any like big tentpole movies they just there's not enough consideration <laughs> happening yeah. like and i i made a comment while we were watching the movie that i was just like there's just so many choices being made at mm-hmm. all times and i i that was like funny i guess we yeah. all laughed about it but it's like but that's important that's what that's what directing is right if yeah. you make Interesting choices, aesthetically, emotionally, yeah. with the actors, story-wise, everything. And so many movies are just made with no consciousness right. whatsoever. And like, just no, not making any conscious decisions. It's just like, let's just shoot it in the most basic way that right. everybody who's, like, literally been to the first week of film school <laughs> knows how to do and i'm not i'm talking about blocking there's obviously yeah. lighting but like in terms of like well you know we're just gonna not violate the 180 rule and like like just shoot coverage back and forth like literally the first project that anyone does in film school like that's half the blockbusters mm-hmm. certain like that's how they're shot and it's just it's maddening but yeah. <laughs> yeah i agree i agree <laughs> Well, right. well, if 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 this hasn't convinced you that this movie is important, <laughs> all right, let me convince you with this Wikipedia factoid. In 2014, <laughs> Time Out pulled several film critics, directors, actors, and stunt actors on their list of top action films, and The Blade ranked 43 on that's, that list. That's very high. Yeah, it's very yeah. high. If it's out of, out of 100, it's on the it's, upper half. Yeah. Like, Well, even if it's just top 100, like, there have been thousands of action movies. Yeah. I, no, that, like, I actually, yeah, it, it's an awesome movie. I'm, I'm gonna, like, try to do a deep dive on Suey Hark now. Uh, okay, it is, it is 100 best action movies from Time Out. Great. Well, well, <laughs> We'll take a look at it at some point. Oh, it's one hundred and one. What's number one? I don't know yet. It, I see that. Uh, oh, uh, one hundred and one. Yeah, Zatoichi's on here too. So, uh, okay. well, it's and it's oh, worldwide. Oh, oh. Aliens. That's interesting. Wait, wait. That's not a photo from Aliens. Though. That's a photo from Aliens. Well, that's an editor's problem. Yeah. Okay, we don't need to get into this. Come oh, on. Oh, Seven Samurai number two. Wild oh. bunch. Uh, the, the police oh. story. This is not a bad list. This is a, this is an acceptable list so far. All right. Um, <laughs> The Road Warrior should be higher. All right. Um, <laughs> oh, Hard Boiled? Hard, yes, yes, Hard Boiled Masterpiece. T2, T2. great, great, great. Raiders. Raiders. Raiders should be, like, top five, but whatever. Right. All right. Okay. All right, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so what were we... All right, so... It's a good movie. It's a good movie. It's Check it out. It is, good, it is available. I said it's not available. You can get it. So if you're willing to spend a little, you know, spend 15 bucks or whatever, you can buy it. But the pace, uh, the pace of this podcast is like the movie yeah. currently. All right. Just like, nonstop, like, just like flying. chaos and choices and control. <laughs> Indeed. So, uh, yeah, check, check the movie out if you can. Uh, I'm sure you can probably find it if you want to be a bad boy or girl. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, so... There's, um, but next, so when we get back, we're going to talk about Junior Jedi Knights, but next week we are going to talk about, we're we're starting a new series, a three book series, three book series, which we'll talk about next week, uh, Adventures in Hyperspace, uh, which is a a Han and Chewie adventure series. Uh Uh-huh. By writer. Writer Wyndham. Yep. Yes, uh, who who wrote a lot of these books, but a lot of stuff that we don't cover, like yeah, like adaptations. And, and, and this kind of this thing. series, honestly, we should not be covering because it it's is so junior. short. It's very very. Uh, but we're gonna cover it anyway. Well, the reason for the, for the younglings. Well, we're gonna cover this because um, there's two books that were released. It was supposed to be four. Four didn't happen, but the third book was written and illustrated, but never released. And the author released it himself. So you can online. find it online. We'll get to all that next week. But that book is called Fire Rain Race. Mm-hmm. Now you made a whole thing about how you want to pick the movie for next week because yeah. I've been picking the we, movies. We haven't gone. We haven't, you haven't even given me the chance to figure this one out oh, yet. No. Oh well, we need to announce it to our listeners. We do. Uh, oh wait. Oh. Be- 
Yeah. Hmm, should I do that movie? Because I've never movie? seen Speed Racer. You haven't seen Speed Racer? <laughs> no, and I know you love Speed Racer. But then Racer. that would be my pick, though. <laughs> yeah, right. All right. But I would love to do Speed Racer, one of my favorite movies of all I time. I mean, I do love that Matthew Fox, so... <laughs> <laughs> He's Racer X. He is Racer X. I'm trying to think of, like, other, like, race movies. Well, there's a lot of... Cannonball. Cannonball, Cannonball Run? Run? <laughs> We've seen Cannonball Run. Oh, you have? That's yeah. surprising. Ball. Cannonball. Cannonball. <laughs> Great song. The song is so much better than the movie. You've seen Days of Thunder, I assume? The Tom when Cruise I was a kid, it's been a long mm, time. That could be an interesting because I feel Wait, like that. Oh, that's a race movie. It's okay. a. It's, it's, it's a like na- a it's... not NASCAR uh, Formula One, I think. Mm. Or no, it's NASCAR. You're yeah, right. Yeah, it is NASCAR. The it's Formula a... One movie's Rush, the Ron Howard one. Oh, that would be interesting. Which too. is supposed to be good. I've heard that's good. Oh, and then we could also do Ford versus Ferrari if we want that. Did you see that? No, I didn't. That was. That's a fun movie. Okay, you've seen that though, so. Uh racing movies oh let's see what goodness. okay well right. how you doing mel uh okay <laughs> it's good to see you we're uh yeah here live from my basement so there's ben hur of course has a very oh, famous yeah, race a great, great it does. race movie oh okay oh fast period <laughs> it's only only days of thunder hours. wow Tell Heights. cars, cars. breaking away i don't know that one breaking away isn't that a bike racing movie um Yes. Yeah. Yep, that's a bike racing movie. I've heard that's good. Okay. All right. But again, I don't want to push anything on you because right. you're like, I want to make the decision next week. You, you could also do uh, movies about rings. Or fire. So like The Ring. The or... Ring. What about Rain of Fire? Yeah. <laughs> That one. Okay. Chariots of Fire. That's Ooh, that's a race movie. That is, that is a race oh! movie. Wow, okay, I think you've you've solved it. Alright. <laughs> Chariots of Fire? Yeah. Beyond that, yeah. I think. Alright. Okay. Uh Chariots of Fire I'm sure is available. It's a best picture winner. Two three. Chariots of Fire. It's available for rent on pretty much every all the platforms. Yeah, yeah, we so. probably just missed it on TCM too. Probably, it... but yeah. All right, 1981's Chariots of Fire, the racing and fire <laughs> for the fire ring race, <laughs> adventures right. in hyperspace. All right, so uh, check that out for next week. Uh, check out the Blade. Uh, great movie. And when we come back, we'll be wrapping up Junior Jedi Knights with Kenobi's Blade. Stay tuned, everybody. Welcome back to Padawan Library. I'm Tim May, here as always. Levi Perrottet. Hello. And Mel Lyon. Hello. Not so much as always. Eh, For this series. You're here, here in, temporarily. You you're are on a visitor's You pass. are here almost every episode. So, I am. Yeah, you know, at least like You have to hear late. half the episode. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, the and, bad half. Well, no, no. <laughs> so true. So true. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this week we are finishing up a series. Mm-hmm. Man, we're just we're knocking them out yeah. this year. Zooming through. We're, we're so used to those long Jude series <laughs> that like we're just like, all right. So this Junior Jedi Knights, which first three books were by Nancy Richardson, and these last three are by Rebecca Mesta. Yep. And uh, all the covers are by. <laughs> hang on, I think it's Eric Law. Uh, Eric Lee. Sorry, Lee. Eric. Eric Lee. And uh, I've enjoyed this series. We, this is like an entire part of the timeline that we've had very little... Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we've had very little uh, dealing in. And uh, I think it's been pretty entertaining. Uh, it's, it's going back to that 90s era, that, that Galaxy of Fear... Uh, mm-hmm. obviously it's much better than your uh, Jedi Princes and that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that, it's a sort of different style. Like, Jude comes in and kind of essentially writes those books as if she's writing for adults. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just kind of in shorter bursts. Not that, like, they're adult books and kids can't read them and they're badass, but, like, <laughs> just, like, the, the level of just prose is, yeah. like, higher and mm-hmm. less kind of directly expletive. Ex- explicative 
Um, and I, I, I found that's, you know, the, the one, th- this feels very much, you know, it's called Junior Jedi Knights. It feels like we're really in the library with, with the younglings yes. right mm-hmm. now. Teaching the children. <laughs> <laughs> So this book, uh, where do where do we leave off on the last book, Mel? Um, in the last book, they had just found um, the holocron, mm-hmm. a holocron, I guess, and uh, Obi Wan Kenobi's blade, mm-hmm. his lightsaber. They found that in Vader's fortress, mm-hmm. and so when we open, they're back in the temple, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. back at the the academy. Yes. Yep. But Luke is gone because he's on court. Yeah, like, yeah. okay. <laughs> this is my biggest, and we'll talk big picture at the end, but this is my biggest problem with this whole series is Luke's absence. Yeah. He's like, an absent uncle. He he's is. basically just like, I don't know even what to call it. Like a, a what is it? Like, he's like a set piece. He's like a, a location. He's just like there, I guess. I don't <laughs> yeah. know. It's just like a reason... Yeah, and, and like even in this book too, because this book is made. Uh, you don't know if you didn't listen to last week's episode or the week before, you would know about older, the teenage boy old who is dear. old dear who old is dear. who is befriended uh, our our stars Anakin Solo yeah. and Tahiri, and like even in this book, like even Tahiri and like Anakin are just like you know. Old Deer wouldn't even be in the Academy if he hadn't, like, forced us to go with him to, like, Luke's meeting. Like, Uncle Luke probably just, like, let him in because he was our friend. Yeah. Like, you know, like... And Old Deer is basically, like, the main character of this book. Yeah, too, he, like, he sucks. is, like, a full arc in this book. Yeah, yeah, like, Tahiri, who we made fun of the fact that the last two books, her arc had entirely to do with the fact that she, like, uh... It's her feet. That, that, that she didn't wear shoes, then... which she, by the way... She wouldn't be wanting to be walking around in the blade with all those bear traps around. Yes. No, um, right? yeah. but uh, I move on. But the <laughs> well, even in this book, she there's a, a whole bit about like they're climbing a yeah, ladder and, and she's she gets com- a blister. She's complaining about her feet hurting, and it's like if anything, see. Nancy, she brings the feet up as the fact that, like, oh, she's from Tatooine. Right. She had to wear shoes all the time. It was super uncomfortable. She loves her mother didn't wear shoes. Whereas, like, Rebecca looks at this and is just like, she should regret not wearing shoes. I mean, and she gives her reasons to regret not wearing shoes. I agree shoes. with Rebecca, yeah. and I feel like she maybe, like, had, you know, maybe one of, I don't know if they had any kids at this time, but, like, maybe one of her kids was walking around barefoot, and she was just like, I need to teach him a lesson, or whatever, but. Yeah. <laughs> that would be probably her son, hang on, I think he gets, he's mentioned in the Kevin above. Jr. No, his name's not <laughs> Kevin Jr. It is now. Oh, his, he's not named, but that's, well, that's for the best. He's great. Never that's given for a the name. best. <laughs> <laughs> like the, you, we just watched the blade. We know how much it can fuck somebody up to not be yeah, have a name. No, like, no, come yeah. on. <laughs> All right. Huh. So, oh, I do think this book opens with the best exposition because that's like a little bit weird in some of the other ones. Okay. But well, this, this one's I want to point out here. So this book opens with Anakin has a puzzle. A, like and he's forming he, like he's putting this puzzle together you don't know what it is and then Ikrit comes in the room just as he completes this puzzle and what the puzzle makes is a hologram of his family Han, Leia, Jason and Gina and himself but no Chewy. No mention of Chewy. Chewy is not essential they to the family. They can't afford Chewy. They can't afford Chewy. I, I'll, I'll say it. You know like this series I really, you know, we can get deeper into this once we go over the, this book, but my biggest disappointment in this series is that this is written for young readers with, and while it's not confusing, I don't want to like, it's very easy to follow, it's still written as a supplement essentially to stuff like either Young Jedi Knights or probably some of the other like adult novels that were written at the time, and I feel like if you're a kid who you're first you're picking up one of these books, it's the first time you're reading a Star Wars book, and you're like, oh, it's about Anakin Solo, that's the kid of Han and Leia. You might want to see Han and Leia and Chewie yeah. and Luke a little bit. I'm not saying they have to be constant presences, but like, like 
Anakin's parents are not in these books. They have like two scenes, right. the hilarious yeah. call home scene from a couple weeks ago. Yeah. And then the but flight home. At the flight, the yeah. flight back to the Academy where Han just like, you know, son, you could stay a couple more yeah. weeks. We'd love to have you. But he never actually like talks to his brother and sister. No. Yeah. You never yeah. see Jason. Or and his mom. By the way, uh, Rebecca's son, she dedicated this book in particular to him. His name is Jonathan. So. Well, Jonathan, shouts to Jonathan. <laughs> you're you're probably about our age, I would guess. <laughs> I, but um, <laughs> anyway, so we uh, – let's get into the book. Okay. Uh, yeah. So from here, uh, they uh, – tie. okay, first off, Luke's gone in Coruscant for two weeks. Luke is all but absent from this. He's movie. in the last scene. He's in the last scene, barely even speaks. So, um, spoiler. Tyone, is that how you guys would say it? Tion. I think I said Tion. Tion. Tion and Ikrit are placed in charge of the academy, and they decide they're going to have a lesson, and they're going to open up the holocron that they got last week. The holocron, of course, uh, is uh, from uh, who is in the holocron? Oh, oh, uh, uh, it's, it's not. Mary. Right. It's not Nomi Sunriders. No, no. It's something um, Crimson. Oh, cr- Crimson with a K and yeah. an A. Crimson. Yeah, yeah Crimson. <laughs> anyway, so they open up the Holocron. It's like a teaching about the Force. The kids are like, oh. But then they're just like, you know what? <laughs> yeah. Kids are like, oh. Oh, wow. Because <laughs> at one point, like, she asked the Holocron a question. And, like, Tahiri's like, wait, you can talk to it? You know, like that sort of thing. Um, but anyway, at some point, they're just, Tion and Ikrit are like, you know what? That's enough. W- let's not make any more decisions with this Holocron until Master Luke gets back. So we're going to go place it in his quarters, and we're going to leave it there. I'm going to put Kenobi's lightsaber there, too. So then we jump to Older, who is, he can't lift a leaf. He is, like, feeling the fact that, like, he has not made any progress in becoming a Jedi, and it's only a few more weeks before Luke is going to kick him out because he's made no progress. And this is chapter two here. There's a bit here I wanted to read. Feeling truly alone, Alder heaved an unhappy sigh. (sighs) <laughs> Through his many failures in trying to learn about the... Th- thoughts of his many failures in trying to learn about the Force nibbled away at his pride. Older was sure now that Asley Crimson was the key. If he could only study her lessons, he felt certain all of his problems would melt away. And so this this causes him, as he's uh, walking through the temple at night, wearing his Jedi robes, he gets this <laughs> idea to take, just borrow the holocron from, you know, Luke's room. He tries to open the holocron, can't, because he's not Force-sensitive, and then he's like, wait a minute, the Mage of Existation, he wanted the holocron, perhaps he could open it. Ooh, I better have something to barter with, so I'll take Kenobi's lightsaber with me, and then I'm gonna hop in the light rider, is that it? The, the- Sun the sun, no, the sun rider, no me, sun rider. Yeah, 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 the sun rider, which is Icarus ship. Icarus ship, and I'm gonna go to Existation. Which, by the way, Existation, he, the mage <laughs> introduces himself as the mage of Existation and uh, the Vader's fortress. In this book, Older mentions Existations, and uh, Tion is like, "Oh, Existation, I know the place." I lived there for a while, right. and, and Master Luke <laughs> found me there. I was trying to start my own Jedi Academy, and that's where Luke found me. And then, like, together we powered up the station, and then he said, come with me. And there was also a Jedi library on Existation, which confused me for a bit because I thought maybe this I was thought it was going to be the Jedi library from Galaxy of Fear. Same, yeah. oh. same, which I had to look up. That's Nepsis 8, not Existation. <laughs> there were two, two Jedi, Jedi libraries, libraries in, oh, in, in, in Space Station. Oh, space my station. goodness. So, anyway, so the mage just so happens to be there. That's where he goes. And then, of course, they have to find older because they're like oh no he took the holocron and the lightsaber we have to get them back we have to find older and they go back but when they go back there is no mention of this library they don't even bother looking for this library the fact that there was a jedi library there is pointless (laughs) yeah 
Oh my god. You, All right. You want to take over? No, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, there's a typo on page 33. Oh, too. God forbid. Okay. All right, relax. I want you to chill well, the fuck out. Well, you know, there's All right. only so many interesting things about this. Is, this is older. <laughs> this is older. What choices did he have left, after all? Master Skywalker said he saw no Jedi potential in older. And outside the cave on Dothamir, Dagobah? Huh? Dothamir. Doth- Dothamir, wow. Dothamir. Yeah, that is a different planet, though. That's, different that's, planet. that's an entirely yeah. different planet. Yeah. yeah. That's, uh, that's where Darth Maul is from. Yeah. Darth- well, yeah, now, I mean, now at this it time, is- it, it was the planet from Courtship of Princess Leia with the witches and all that mm. stuff. Well, the so. witches, I think, were still on Dothamir in Clone Wars. They are, they are, but uh, at this point, that would have been referring to... Dave Wolverton's the courtship who, the who, wizard of storytelling who, himself. The wizard who gets who gets shouts yeah. in the acknowledgement. So. <laughs> shouts the wizard. <laughs> He's the one who started it all. <laughs> for us, yeah, yeah, for our podcast. Um definitely the probably the funniest moment of that first episode, I guess. <laughs> Alright. Um It'd be on the clip show episode. <laughs> oh, maybe we'll do a clip show one there day. There you go. Maybe. Yeah. Alright. The fans are demanding it already. <laughs> Um, okay, <laughs> so then they go, they ch- they chase after Alder, and this is chapter five, and, um, hang on, let me, oh wait, that's another moment, I don't have this written down. There's a part where, like, the children are like, we have feelings about Alder here, and, uh, oh, page 40. On existation, you no, mean, on, or, like, before? On the way to existation, yeah. yeah. I've got a strange feeling about this. I can't decide whether I'm really angry at Older or just worried about him, Anakin said. To hear he blinked and turned to look at Anakin's ice blue eyes. Strange, she said. I was trying to decide if I felt more guilty or betrayed. Um, and then this goes on. Uh, see, Ikrit's scratchy voice drifted from the uh, front of the cock, uh, from drifted back from the front of the cockpit. Of course, is. Our course is verified. R2 beeped, yada, yada, yada. Uh, wh- Anakin asked, why would you feel guilty? Tahiri shrug- shrugged and wiggled uncomfortably in her crash webbing. Suddenly the ship seemed too quiet. There was no sound except for the low humming of the hyperdrive engines. I feel guilty because I should have been a better friend to Alder, Tahiri said. Maybe if I spent more time encouraging him and practicing with him, he wouldn't have done this. But we did help him, Anakin pointed out. If it hadn't been for us, I don't think Uncle Luke would have let Alder stay at the Jedi Temple. To hear he sighed. Probably not. But if we had stayed, but if he hadn't stayed, at least the holocron and Obi-Wan Kenobi's blade wouldn't be missing. How could Alder do something like this? Old Anakin's cheeks turned pink as if he were ashamed. I don't know. I thought he was our friend. We fought for him and practiced with him, but I guess he didn't really trust us. Maybe it wasn't enough that we tried to be his friends. What else should we have done, Tahiri asked, feeling despair fill her. R2 swiveled his head and whistled twice, Mm. the little droid signal for no. R2 is right, Tion said. You can't blame yourselves. We can never know exactly why Alder left. But the reason probably made sense to him. To understand why people do things that they do, we need to learn to see things through their eyes. One thing I'm certain of, though, older is old enough to know right from wrong. Oh. So this is a fun little emotional moment that um, I don't think actually pays off at all in the end. <laughs> <laughs> it's cute. It's cute that they have it. That's true. I agree. Yeah. I, I think there's... Um, there's something like there are good like mo- this is actually I think a consistent problem basically through this whole series but I think there's like little moments that are really nicely observed character moments but just the overall you never get a sense when you finish one of these books that anything matters yeah, right <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, very superficial yeah, yeah. yeah. and like that that's frustrating. I don't want to. Obviously, uh, Rebecca Mesta is, is is her own writer, so I don't want to like compare her work to her husband's work too directly. But as a fan of, of of the adult Star Wars novels this time, Kevin J. Anderson was always a great idea guy, 
and I feel like his books were always very dry. Mm. And I want it's a kind of a similar vibe, and I I don't want to like you know because you know they're, they're they're their own people, but I, I it reminds me of that. It gives mm-hmm. me that same kind of just uh, like I like the characters at least on a basic like conceptual level and there's like good little moments but for the most part the storytelling is very dry and Mm -hmm. the stories don't put the characters through anything Mm -hmm. to the point where they're actually different at the end or even if they're not different if they just they've been through something like it doesn't feel like they've been through anything right yeah because you have like the tihuri moments great example where it's like by the end of which the fourth book, it's like, oh, I like shoes, and then the next book is like, no, I don't. Yeah. So it's, yeah. Yeah, the characters do really know evolving past the fourth book, in my right. opinion. Because so so much of the series is Anakin, like, am I inherently evil? And mm. then, like, he gets out of Dagobah, and he's like, nah, you know, I'm it's not. It's just not, like, an issue anymore. Yeah, yeah, because, like, Nancy Richardson tries to tackle that, and then, you know... It's clumsily. Clumsily, yeah. Am, yeah. But... but at least it's, like, something. Yeah. And I feel like Anakin has zero character in yeah. this book. Yeah, yeah. He's, like, he's... he's barely... Well, our two main characters in this book are not significant. Old Deer is the lead of this book. Yeah. I agree. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I agree. Also, Tion, this this <laughs> part made me laugh too. Anakin, because they're talk, they're going through her ship and looking at all her old artifacts. The lore seeker, you know, because she's this classic she, ship name. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, she seeks lore. Yeah. What can Anakin, I say? Anakin, <laughs> Anakin. He pointed past her on on onto the. Uh, he pointed past her into the cockpit at the pair of fluffy objects that dangled from the ceiling just above R2-D2's head. Oh, those? Those are uh, Arkden gaming cubes. They're supposed to bring luck, but I just keep them because they're centuries old. Classic <laughs> chance cube! And, and, yes. and I like the way they look. In my opinion, she's just a hipster. She's yeah, just she like, really oh, is. they're old? I like those. I mean, listen... <laughs> You know, guys, I don't know if we can really criticize yeah, them sitting that's here. That's the problem. It's, like, too relatable. Like, <laughs> I'm just sitting here looking at a photo of you guys dressed as Old West people. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, you know, this is, the, this is the good content you guys get when we record in person. Yeah, it is. Yeah, you gotta was... post that photo on the Instagram. Yeah, okay. we should be yeah. doing. It's on my Instagram. Us, uh, in the lore seeker, yeah. like oh, in our old artifacts. <laughs> uh, so anyway, Aldir he finds the mage. The mage thinks it's a trap initially, but until finally, Aldir is like, "No, I want you to teach me." And the mage is like, "All right." So what the mage is doing is like. He's making older... What's the mage's name again? Oh, Orlok. Orlok. Yeah. Orlok. Orlok. Great name. Or- or- Orlok. Orlok. Orlok, he is making older think he's moving things, like platforms and turbo lifts, when really he just keeps... He, he uh, Orlock keeps fingling with the spangle. Fingling? Fingling, yeah. He keeps fingling the spangles on his robe, is what they call them, um, which you can see on the cover of this book. And that's like, he's got the whole place wired to these spangles, and he can make things happen. And there's this one bit here where, like, okay... My dear boy, you're too modest, Orlok crooned. Your abilities are far greater than you know. Here, I'll show you. Tell me what I'm thinking right now. The mage crossed his slender arms in front of his chest and looked at Aldor with a warm smile. Aldir tried to reach out with the force to sense what the mage was thinking. In truth, he sensed nothing. He thought about the marvelous things the mage had shown him how to do in the past day. Lifting objects, turning lights or machinery on and off with the wave of a hand, getting a ranat to obey him using a voice of command. All right, can we talk about the ranats <laughs> or yeah. whatever? Ranats, yeah. yeah. These are rat-like humanoid creatures. Uh-huh. From Tatooine, right? Yeah, from said? Tatooine, yeah. yeah huh? Or is that a... Different than a womp rat, I guess. All right, is, is that, like, a thing outside of this book? Let's see. Because I also, I find the name Renat very annoying to say. Yeah. And they also or always, read. 
always capitalize it, don't they, in this book? Yeah, yeah, Ranad is always capitalized, too. So is it like they're from a certain place in Tatooine? <laughs> All right, well, let's find out here. Oh, hang on, I do want to get to this one little bit, though. Okay, using a voice of command, there was so much more. Why, then, was he unable to sense someone's thoughts? The mage must be right, Alder decided. He needed to have more confidence in his abilities. He opened his eyes again and took a guess. Uh, you're proud of me? So sad. <laughs> there, my boy, you see, Horlock said with a relieved smile. He stroked his neatly bearded chin with slender fingers. You had the power to sense my thoughts all along. So sad, so manipulative. And, like, again, like, for what reason? Why is Orlock doing this? Like, what? Yeah, like, I don't really... Because especially where he winds up at the end... His, his character makes no sense. Yeah. The back of the book describes him as a very evil man. He's not. Yeah. He, he's, and he's very amoral. You, you said. Well, first off, first off, <laughs> we should mention like he's got the Ranats and assassin and droids, droids. <laughs> pirate droids of various types, hovering assassin droids. That's I suppose pretty evil. Yeah, and they do drug older when he shows up. Like he feels a prick in his. Okay, okay, he he's a bad out. guy. He's a bad guy. I just. <laughs> but it's also like, is this just like his house? Or I guess these... so. Yeah. Well, well, are... He claims he's of Exus right. Station. Station. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is like his evil lair, I guess. Yeah. Ranats, Ranats, a Ranat <laughs> shows up in the cantina scene in A New Hope. Uh, it's the little mouse-looking okay. character who, like, reaches for the yeah. cup and uses both hands. That's a Ranat. So. Okay. So, F- fine. I, I'm not mad about it. I just, like, I was like, is this, like, a... I couldn't tell from the description. All right. Um, yeah, so... Uh, have have the rest of them shown up yet? Like, they... yeah, they've shown up. I think. They, yeah, they get yeah. there. Um, Which they... they describe Exist Station, and it actually sounds like pretty cool because it's like it's not just like uh, the size of a planet; it's like a whole solar system that's yeah, it's, just all a. It's space got like station. different tubes and stuff yeah. coming off of it because there's like a part where like aquatic uh, species can live, right. and then there's chlorine breathing species uh a place for them wild okay so let's see what else happens here uh you know i wish i could breathe chlorine so i could spend all my days in the pool i don't know speaking of hold on speaking of i immediately i'm like i'm abandoning this bit halfway through (laughs) i'm just like i'm gonna be a surfer guy and then wait no 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 Surfing and chlorine. Surfing and chlorine. <laughs> Tim, you're always on the endless surf thing at like the water park, or <laughs> they like on the cruise ship where you can surf. It's just like shooting the, the wave the up. Wave and Tim's just like, man, I wish this chlorine wasn't so detrimental to my body. Cowabunga, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yeah. I wish I could thrive <laughs> off of this chlorine. <laughs> When they do get there, there's this bit, this, like, almost throwaway bit where it's like, R2 assured them that there was now sufficient air in the hangar bay for them to breathe. How? Because he's R2. Does he have, like, sensors like that, though? The, the ship and might. Just, the lore like, seeker might. He could be t- He could be tapped yeah, into the Yeah, he could be, well, like, that little... Outside. The, yeah. Oh, I guess they're, like, outside I mean, he now. keeps tweeting throughout this book like he did the last <laughs> book, so he, <laughs> like he's, a... he keeps tweeting up a storm, yeah. so... <laughs> All right. <laughs> Classic. Okay. They show up. They get attacked by droids. At one point, um, they're, like, they're trying to close a blast door. The droids are coming... R2, like, the door starts to go up, R2 is closing the door, and they basically have to abandon R2 in order to escape, because R2 is like, leave me. Which they have this whole, like, conversation about. Yeah, where they're like, like... we can't leave R2, (laughs) and then they're just like, we have to leave R2. So they leave him, and then they climb in the air ducts, and then they find this room where they take a breather, they maybe take a nap, they have a good sleep, Oh, this is also where Tahiri, she's climbing the ladder and complaining about her feet. Mm -hmm. They take a break, and then they find some refresher units, which we didn't talk about this last week. Is this where they do that? Well, they do this before they confront the mage. 
and refresher units in my opinion are uh, are given to us like showers like in the first couple books they seem yeah. like showers right and then last week in vader's fortress they find some refresher units yeah and they all stop to use the refresher units so they stop to shower and then this week they do the same thing. They stop to shower before, like, the final battle. Which I guess would just be, like, the importance of hygiene for young teenagers. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why that would be I guess. In these books. <laughs> well, you know, I... All right. So, do they? When's the confrontation? Okay, they I, like, like forever. I, yeah, like, they, uh, they say so they say much. they say hours go by after they use the refresher to try to find the mage. They find him, and uh, they he has R two D two hostage. He has a restraining bolt on him. So this is where we have our big attack scene. They are able to uh, use the force and get the holocron and the lightsaber away from the mage. They run off, and they end up in the mage's workshop, and they get trapped in there. And they, the mage, he's got strobe lights, fog machines, big old statues, big old statues. You know, uh, you know, he's got all sorts of things going in there. And then this is where they are like barraged by steam and strobe. And, and like blasters, droids, droids, yeah, with yeah. blasters, and um. Nothing, this is just, it's like it's a couple kind chapters. It's like a whole lot of nothing, yeah. like some of these chapters. However, however, so Tion, at one point, she goes down, she gets shot somewhere, and she had her lightsaber, and then she's like, give this to Ikrit. <laughs> and Anakin, he takes the lightsaber, and he chucks the lightsaber, and the lightsaber ends up in Ikrit's hand, and the mage is like, oh, you're going to send your pet after me? And this is actually my favorite part of this book. Oh, this part yeah, is cool. Yeah, this was kind of like Because Ikrit and R2-D2 have this, like, codependent relationship, and R2 is totally cool with it. And Ikrit ignites the lightsaber, and R2 charges towards the mage. Like, Ikrit is riding R2 with a lightsaber and is fighting <laughs> the mage with the light. Like, oh. there's a lightsaber battle, and R2 is in the heat of it. Like, I, uh... <laughs> I don't remember which book it's in. There's a book that my brother told me about, I think Darksaber maybe, where Leia has a lightsaber duel with uh, with a hut. <laughs> so that just sounds delightful to me. <laughs> I... <laughs> um, this ultimately ends in somehow... Um... See, you don't know how it. Gr- yeah, it's the action it, is not it, described. It, it, very yeah, because well. you don't. They don't go into this lightsaber battle yeah. with Ikrit, other than the fact that like Ikrit somehow disarms the mage, and Anakin gets Kenobi's blade, right. and then Anakin slashes at the mage's the tassels, the tassels, and the spangles, and then <laughs> the, he loses the spangles all the, in the sequence. The yeah. spangles and the tassels <laughs> and the dullies. and the tapestries. Oh, the tapestries. <laughs> 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 um, so he disarms the mage and the mage is like well you haven't taken all my powers yet and then he does his smoke cloud and yeah. he disappears and at that point uh well Oldor, uh he saves the day at some point by disarming a droid and he realizes the error of his ways and and it's like the first time that his voice like doesn't crack. Yeah. And that's like as close as we yeah. get to like uh, character and development then, is and, older is yeah. changing. And then he realizes, you know what? My parents wouldn't be a, be a pilot, but they're boring cargo pilots. I I I found out that I'm good at piloting and I can do things with my piloting. So he flies them back home because uh, Tion is she's incapacitated, even though she's doing healing meditation the entire way home um, <laughs> that Luke taught her. And then they get back. Luke's there, and this is where Older leaves the academy, and he says goodbye to his friend. Goes off with old Puckham. Old Puckham, mm. I'm so happy Puckham shows up here because he wasn't in the last one. Right? He wasn't. No. 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 Oh. 
Puckham, Puckham might be Puckham and Ikrit might be my Top two favorite character. characters. Definitely my favorite characters. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and uh, and then older, he's like, I'm gonna go join like the rescue corps, and I'm gonna go fly ships and help people from like fires and but, like yeah. emergencies. Sounds good. Yep. Yeah, for a 13 year old, I guess. Which, <laughs> no. which this is not the last. Uh, the last of this legends lore has seen of Aldor. Older shows up in the uh, in New Jedi Order for a single book where he is working for the Rescue Corps or something like that. So he shows up there, and most of these characters show up in that series uh, too. Um, actually, spoiler alert: Ikrit sacrifices himself during the Yuuzhan Han Vong invasion to save Tahiri and Anakin. So, and then uh, Anakin gets killed later, doesn't he? Yeah, Anakin dies at the end of that. So many needless deaths happen in that series. <laughs> it's like... It's Chewbacca especially, because it's like... Well, well, we don't even need Yeah, this. because you can... Getting rid of, like, these characters, these characters dying is nothing, because they're not, like, they're... they're... Well, the whole idea yeah. was they wanted to kill somebody from the movies in uh, the first book. Terrible. And I think they they... they Wanted to kill Luke, and then Lucas shot that down, and uh, so then they wound up settling on Chewbacca. Terrible. Because he so, gets, yeah. like, trampled, Which too, on, like, like, a planet that's, like, com- com- yeah, colliding get, uh, with a, a moon. Planet hits, a moon hits him or whatever. Yeah. It's terrible. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I know, like, we got a bunch of Legends freaks in our audience that probably like that. But, you know... All what, power to And you, you know what, right? too, with that bullshit, too... Is like, isn't like Han because I've read this book way back in the day. Isn't like Han like on like the the land like the like the the boarding platform for the Falcon like trying to reach I, for him? I have not and, read this book in I'm twenty fa- years, and I'm man. fairly certain Anakin is the one piloting the Falcon, and he, okay. and like oh, and like Han like blames Anakin. It's this whole thing. Oh, it's terrible. Yeah, that sounds bad. Yes. Yeah, so, All right, so. Let's talk about, let's raid this book, and then we'll talk about the series overall. Okay. Um, I agree with a lot of the complaints that have been issued here. I didn't, well, it was pretty silent, but I think this is quite a whimpering end. I looked, I tried to figure out if this book, this series got canceled, or if this was planned as, like, the final book. If it was planned as the last book, I... I mean, come on! No like way. this is like this does nothing for Anakin and Tahiri, who are our leads. So that's a bummer. Um, it might have just gotten canceled. In that case, you know, what are you going to do? But you, I, I won't criticize it on that level, I guess. But I just found it very anticlimactic. I don't think the mage is a good villain, uh, and I don't think Old Deer is that interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, I kind of find him interesting maybe going forward after this as a character, but I think this could have all been done in his first appearance. Like, I don't think we needed to have three books for him to get to this point because it's like you already knew essentially what was going to happen. He was either going to turn to the dark side, although he didn't have much facility to the force, so could he have really... Well, he turned to the mage side. (laughs) That's the other thing. Like, they didn't want to just play with any real dark side shit. I mean, I know, like... The Bantam era in general avoided Sith stuff, which I like. Actually, I prefer you mm-hmm. avoid that because I feel like that undercuts Return of the Jedi. Uh, I think basically any continued Jedi Sith battles post Return of the Jedi, especially when it involves the characters from the movies, undercuts Return mm-hmm. of the Jedi. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't need to go further down that road, but the <laughs> good point. Good but point. Um, I, I just, I, you know. I enjoyed this series overall, but this one just, I think, is probably the weakest of these books. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I got to go, like, pretty low on this. I'm going to go four out of ten. Mini chlorine. Mm-hmm. All right. Wow. Mel, what? Yeah, this book sucked. <laughs> <laughs> I really uh, almost did not, like, make it through this book because at a certain point, like, I was like, I just don't want to read this. <laughs> like... Uh, older, yeah, could have just been in one book, and then, like, the whole, not even really, like, making a choice between good and bad, or, like, it's, because it's not even, like, good and bad, it's, like, do I want to be a douchebag or not, like, come on, um, and the mage sucks, because, again, he's not really bad, he just 
sucks. <laughs> so yeah, I'm gonna give this one. Would you give it a four? Yeah. I'm gonna give it a three. Then. Oh, wow. <laughs> All right. So um, this book, I agree. I think this is the worst book of the series. It's the least eventful because this final battle doesn't happen till like page eighty. And up until that, it's just like we're on ships, we're it's looking at holograms. Like it, it's like it's really slow before we get like actually anything going. And like like I said, I think the highlight of this book is is Icarus charging the mage on R two D 2s head with a lightsaber. Which also at the end of this book, they bring up the fact that Icarus, remember, he nearly killed a friend, and Master Yoda had to intervene, and he tossed away his lightsaber for good, swore them off. Well, after holding Tahiri's lightsaber, he was just He's like... He's just like, hmm. there's battles worth fighting. There's battles worth fighting. Which I'm just like, it actually, like, that... Un- I- I'm-, I'm sure he's an interesting character going forward, you know, because he's used elsewhere. But, like, what makes him unique and interesting is that he's a Jedi without a lightsaber. Mm-hmm. And, like, that has an opposition to that. And, like, that's... That's interesting. That's yeah. something that could be played with, and like they just take it away. Yeah, like, because yeah. at the end he constructs a lightsaber, so uh, I I picture it hanging off a little belt off his little cute waist, like a collar, maybe. Or <laughs> Ooh, something. a collar. I mean, he's adorable. He is yeah, the... right. He's so cute. He's, he's like like I said many weeks ago. He's like Rio Oki for my Tenshi Muyo heads shouts. <laughs> <laughs> um, I agree with everybody else. This is like a three. This book was just boring, and the mage is not cool, and so, yeah, that's it. So now we're going to go in, we're going to talk about the series as a whole, we're going to do a little wrap-up here, and I think first we're going to, let's talk about the covers here. Okay. Because I think out of all of our series that we read, this book, this series is up there in terms of its covers with, like, Galaxy of Fear. This has some of the most interesting covers. Well, it's certainly the best, like, illustration, which I always prefer Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I I'm not a fan of the orange jumpsuits in general, <laughs> yeah. so that that hampers. They just keep getting they're that's, that's not the fault of the covers, but that's that hampers I like how say, much I can enjoy them. Eric yeah. is very consistent with these because Anakin's shoes are these like buckled shoes with these high socks, oh, and yeah, they do appear in the covers. <laughs> he is consistent. Each... And and Tahiri is always barefoot. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm seeing. Yep. Right. Yep. yep. Uh huh. I think it's funny, even if you look just at like these books we have here, like how much more worn, like the the first four are. Versus like oh, yeah, his my, last my two copy that just of, nobody like wanted your, Yeah, your copies. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. I mean, obviously we don't know where. I mean, some of these are library copies. Yeah, of, but, yeah. but but and I think definitely even like especially like the last one, like you see Anakin defeating the mage. It's so the end of the book, right why there. Why would you read this book? Uh-huh. Like, I'll say my favorite of these covers by far is Vader's Fortress. Okay, really? I think yeah, just okay. that's a dynamic composition i like anakin's pose on it like he looks like really like fricks frisky you know um and i like the like big vader statue behind them um i really like this and this is gonna sound weird i know you hate the kenobi's blade cover because the mage is i don't no hate problem. it it's just i'm not a fan of the mage well, what's funny is like and the... he like looks like a weird like fu manchu thing which yeah i mean but, uh... but uh, on the cover <laughs> yeah. here anakin he's got this like lightsaber he has slashed the mage he's got this look on his face like whoa i can't like, believe i did it yeah but i think he looks like john ham on that cover like a young john oh Hamm. yeah okay i can see that mm-hmm. yeah yeah he doesn't have that ham vibe on any of the other covers but that one he's like really hamming it up so <laughs> I like the Lyrics World cover. That's a good cover. Because it's a big old snake. And I think Lyrics World, if we're talking about the series as a whole, Lyrics World is, like, one of the more interesting entries in this series. I wish they were all, like, Lyrics World. Like, let's go to a different planet and discover these different things and, like, make is that what Is that the Dagobah then... one? No, no, that's, like, Lyrics the Mermaid episode. The, Remember? the Yavin 8. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, that, that was cool. I... Pick your, uh, oh, pick your cover whenever. Um, you. I'm I gotta go classic that Golden Globe, so pretty. That is a good cover. Yeah. I think I that's know. the best Tahiri looks yeah. in any of the covers. That's, yeah, too. like her face, like that's a really good facial expression. Yeah, great, great hair too, and then like 
all the other cover... Little Egret. <laughs> yeah, I feel like the last book, like, this last book, because you get Tion on this cover, too, but, like, you got these really cartoon Ranats there. You and got an assassin, IG. this IG <laughs> unit that's a little wacky proportional. And then Tion and Tahiri are a little more cartoony. And then you got R2, who's featured he's... on quite a few of these covers. And it's well, he's, mo- he's a pretty prominent. Yeah, and it. he's his most illustrated on that cover. And some of these other covers, he's, like, pretty detailed in terms of, like, shading and everything. But that cover, I feel like, is his worst looking on the cover but that's fair i mean as far as the series on the whole i i I see where you're coming from with lyrics world i think my favorite book in the series is probably still anakin's quest which is the first rebecca one and the only one i think that's good but (laughs) but um that one's the one where they go to dagobah and they have to go through the cave and i think that told me everything I needed to know about Old Year mm-hmm. entirely. Like, even though I think I made a joke on that episode that, like, that, um, uh, what's her name? Uh, um, Nancy Richardson? No. Uh, Tahiri? Tahiri. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, guess. But Tahiri, uh, the, the joke was that in Anakin's Quest that her arc was about uh, her bare feet. She does at least get that sequence in the cave in that book and that Mm -hmm. is a good that does have a strong arc for anakin but the problem is that it resolves his conflict for the entire series Mm -hmm. essentially about his legacy the legacy of his grandfather and then he's just a boring kid yeah it it like really closes his arc because like you know at at what you know you go to vader's fortress and you think vader's fortress might like result in something along with this but it really doesn't if anything it only the only thing it results in is he sees the hologram of Luke and is like, "Oh, my grandpa like looking at this," and that causes him to construct the hologram of his family at the beginning of this book, right. like because wow. he's just like, "Oh, I can look at them." Like, you know, I, I, yeah. So I would say my favorite of the series is still Anakin's Quest, but then I would put all three Nancy books above the last two yeah. books. Um, mm-hmm. I did really like Lyrics World. I remember. I don't really remember anything about Promises. That oh, that was the Tatooine That's one, a Tatooine yeah. one. which that pissed me off because Luke didn't Luke go. Luke wasn't there. Yeah. What um, the fuck? And I, I I didn't love Promises. Golden Globe is okay, although again the central conflict of the Golden Globe, which plays out of the first three books, I did not find very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel like the Golden Globe could have been resolved within that first book, and then just. We have a different adventure. Or, every book. Yeah. or you resolve the Golden Globe in the final book right. and make this because the fact that it's like it's this curse of Exar Kun. Yeah, and for like, like thousands of years. Thousands yeah. of, years, or hundreds of years. And like the undoing of that could be this like big thing where he like meets Exar Kun's ghost or something like this. Right. But that doesn't happen because it almost feels like Nancy knew she wasn't getting another book and she's just like, I'm going to wrap this up right now because it is really just like this added coda to the end of promises, promises. And, uh, I, and I think the last three have their own story with old deer. Um, it's weird. Cause I think why Anakin's quest work is, is that it incorporates Anakin's character arc from the first three books and it introduces some new ideas, but it also essentially wraps up all those ideas mm-hmm. in the book. So that's why I think it's the strongest. It just feels the most complete of any of these books. Yeah. Um, but then that also results in a complete fall off for the last two. <laughs> so, yeah. Any, yeah. You got a favorite one? Um, n- no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, how can you pick? Yeah, I mean, I I didn't feel as great about Anakin's quest so i don't know i guess i don't know i guess i would have to go with lyrics world i just feel like visually there's more of that that like stuck in my mind with the mer people whatever lyric they, the, well lyric and what were they oh they were called melodies yeah, yeah. The yeah. Melodies. and puckum is big in that one puckum's big in that and the different beasties and stuff which you know love them or hate them whatever but it's like Oh, because this had the whole spider thing that was like oh, a narrator yeah. too. Oh yeah, it did. So. Oh, that <laughs> was a good sequence. Yeah, that yeah. was a good sequence. Yeah. <laughs> Lyrics World is definitely like up there. And you know what? Promises is great too because you have um, you have Tahiri's Sylvan, Sylvan yeah. the Tuscan Raider, 
who raised to hear and, yeah. and I think and I think that's like a very good character as well. So yeah. there's a lot of like good Shit. stuff in those. I forgot how like much better those first three books <laughs> are than like the last two we read. <laughs> Yeah, Sylvan is a true legend. Generally, yeah, I think the first four of these books are all interesting. They uh-huh. they all have problems. I don't love the way they're written, really, and I'm not a huge fan of uh, some of the characterizations, some of the story choices, all that stuff, and, you know, I'm not a big beastie person, <laughs> but... Those first four books all feel cohesive, coherent. These last two just, it's like, okay, so we're taking this supporting character from the from the fourth book, mm-hmm. and we're making him the main character. Yeah. And it's weird. Like, I don't I, get it. Like, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, uh, the only reason, there. the only way I feel like that makes sense is if they thought that there were going to be more of these. That yeah. Because it just does not feel like it. It does not feel like a conclusion. Also, too, how does Luke, like, okay... Luke uh, lets Alder into the academy, but then like he lets okay with his parents' permission, but then he lets them him go to Vader's fortress, which is like in an inherently dangerous place See, that he knows about. That he right. knows about Anakin, he can get away with because Anakin's his nephew. Tahiri has no parents, so if she dies, that's fine. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's not fine. Old Deer snuck along, didn't he? No, Old Year snuck along in this book, oh, but they okay. were like, oh, we, be- yeah. we better take him to Vader's yeah. Fortress this time, and like Luke's like, okay. Yeah, Luke? I mean, Luke is just not a good headmaster. I... There's so many kids, I'm so overwhelmed by all this shit. I wonder how, he's, how he is characterized in the Young Jedi Knights mm, books, mm. which aren't in the scope of this show, but uh-huh. I'd be curious to read those. And see what I mean, because those are also I mean Rebecca Mesta is the primary author of those books, I believe. So mm-hmm. I wonder if Luke is just more involved with Jason and Jaina. Uh, so I'm trying to think, is that the series that starts with the Dark Academy, right? I am not sure. Those are the kind of I young adult that's... books. They're thicker, yeah. but. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'd be curious to check out those books at some point. Obviously, well, like a year, a minimum a year after we're done with this podcast, when I feel like reading Star Wars <laughs> books again. But oh, there are so many. There's fourteen of right, them. Oh my yeah. god! It is. Which one did you say? The Shadow Academy is Shadow Academy. Number, that's number two. Hairs oh, okay. to the Force. Heir to the Force. Heir to the Force. Yeah. Yeah. First yeah. One. yeah uh, that's a lot. That's a lot of books. Yeah, yeah and they're I'm... they're beloved. People right. love those books. Yeah. I so I don't want to like just completely shit on Rebecca Mesta. I don't know if maybe it's just like they needed them quickly. Nancy dropped out for whatever reason. Maybe that's why she yeah, just comes maybe. in and like plots it super quick and it's slap shot. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Slip shot is what I meant to say. Slap shot is a oh, hockey, hockey thing. Yeah. All right. So. <laughs> all right. Uh, We're all learning something today. So, yeah. Um, that's the end of that series. Next week, we're covering adventures in hyperspace. We're beginning a new tiny three book series. Mm-hmm. And uh, thank you, Mel, for being here for the Aww, run. Aw, yes. It was very fun. So enjoyable. I'm sure we'll get you on at least one or two more times yeah. before the end of the podcast. Mm-hmm. So, Which is, like, pretty soon, right? It'll be the, the fall end. sometime. It'll yeah. be, uh, before the end of the year. So. Wow, the so, end of an era. So that's the end of oh Padawan Library as a junior novel you podcast. Guys. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. There, there are... There have been rumblings. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, baby, yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> I'm not sure about that rumbling. Anyway, so, we'll talk. Uh, anyway, so, yeah, we're checking out Adventures in Hyperspace next week. Everybody go watch The Blade. The Blade Good movie. rules. Uh, don't bother with this unless, you know, if, if you're a fan, you're a fan. I understand. Enjoy. Anyway. Next week, Adventures in Hyperspace, Fire, Rain, Race. We'll be watching the 1981 Best Picture winner, Chariots of Fire. Very famous Vangelis yeah. score. Shouts to Vangelis. And, uh, yeah. Oh, until the books are due back? I'm going out to the pool, throwing on for unlawful carnal knowledge and sucking on that chlorine filter, <laughs> baby. <laughs> Smiling out! <laughs> yeah, baby, cowabunga! <laughs>
Padawan Library is hosted and produced by Tim May and Levi Peretic. It is edited by Tim May. Our theme song is by The Astral Project. Our artwork is by Freddie Funbuns. Padawan Library is copyright 2021. Tim May and Levi Peretic. All rights reserved. <laughs>